Animal Farm by George Orwell Chapter 4 By the late summer, the news of what happened on Animal Farm had spread across half the country. Every day, Snowball and Napoleon sent out flights of pigeons whose instructions were to mingle with the animals on neighboring farms, tell them the story of the rebellion, and teach them the tune of Beasts of England. Most of this time, Mr. Jones had spent sitting in the tap room of the Red Lion at Willingdon, complaining to anyone who would listen of the monstrous injustice he had suffered in being turned out of his property by a pack of good-for-nothing animals. The other farmers sympathized in principle, but they did not at first give him much help. At heart, each of them was secretly wondering whether he could not somehow turn Jones's misfortune to his own advantage. It was lucky that the owners of the two farms which adjoined Animal Farm were on permanently bad terms. One of them, which was named Foxwood, was a large, neglected, old-fashioned farm, much overgrown by woodland, with all its pastures worn out and its hedges in a disgraceful condition. Its owner, Mr. Pilkington, was an easy-going gentleman who spent most of his time in fishing or hunting according to the season. The other farm, which was called Pinchfield, was smaller and better kept. Its owner was a Mr. Frederick, a tough, shrewd man, perpetually involved in lawsuits and with a name for driving hard bargains. These two disliked each other so much that it was difficult for them to come to any agreement, even in defense of their own interests. Nevertheless, they were both thoroughly frightened by the rebellion on Animal Farm, and very anxious to prevent their own animals from learning too much about it. At first they pretended to laugh to scorn the idea of animals managing a farm for themselves. The whole thing would be over in a fortnight, they said. They put it about the animals on the manor farm. They insisted on calling it the manor farm. They would not tolerate the name Animal Farm, were perpetually fighting among themselves, and were also rapidly starving to death. When time passed and the animals had evidently not starved to death, Frederick and Pilkington changed their tune and began to talk of the terrible wickedness that now flourished on Animal Farm. It was given out that the animals there practiced cannibalism, tortured one another with red-hot horseshoes, and had their females in common. This was what came of rebelling against the laws of nature, Frederick and Pilkington said. However, these stories were never fully believed. Rumors of a wonderful farm where the human beings had been turned out and the animals managed their own affairs continued to circulate in vague and distorted forms, and throughout the year a wave of rebelliousness ran through the countryside. Bulls, which had always been tractable, suddenly turned savage. Sheep broke down hedges and devoured the clover. Cows kicked the pail over. Hunters refused their fences and shot their riders onto the other side. Above all, the tune and even the words of Beasts of England were known everywhere. It had spread with astonishing speed. The human beings could not contain their rage when they heard this song, though they pretended to think it was merely ridiculous. They could not understand, they said, how even animals could bring themselves to sing such contemptible rubbish. Any animal caught singing it was given a flogging on the spot, and yet the song was irrepressible. The blackbirds whistled it on the hedges, the pigeons cooed it in the elms, it got into the din of the smithies and the tune of the church bells. And when the human beings listened to it, they secretly trembled, hearing in it a prophecy of their future doom. Early in October, when the corn was cut and stacked, and some of it was already threshed, a flight of pigeons came whirling through the air and alighted in the yard of Animal Farm in the wildest excitement. Jones and all of his men, with half a dozen others from Foxwood and Pinchfield, had entered the five-barred gate and were coming up the cart track that led to the farm. They were all carrying sticks except Jones, who was marching ahead with a gun in his hands. Obviously, they were going to attempt the recapture of the farm. This had long been expected and all preparations had been made. Snowball, who had studied an old book on Julius Caesar's campaigns, which he had found in the farmhouse, was in charge of the defensive operations. He gave his orders quickly, and in a couple of minutes, every animal was at his post. As the human beings approached the farm buildings, Snowball launched his first attack. All the pigeons, to the number of thirty-five, flew to and fro over the men's heads and muttered upon them, from midair, 
and while the men were dealing with this, the geese, who had been hiding behind the hedge, rushed out and pecked viciously at the calves of their legs. However, this was only a light skirmishing maneuver, intended to create a little disorder, and the men easily drove the geese off with their sticks. Snowball now launched his second line of attack. Muriel, Benjamin, and all the sheep, with Snowball at the head of them, rushed forward and prodded and butted the men from every side, while Benjamin turned round and lashed at them with his small hoofs. But once again, the men, with their sticks and their hobnailed boots, were too strong for them. And suddenly, at a squeal from Snowball, which was the signal for retreat, all the animals turned and fled through the gateway into the yard. The men gave a shout of triumph. They saw, as they imagined, their enemies in flight, and they rushed after them in disorder. This was just what Snowball had intended. As soon as they were well inside the yard, the three horses, the three cows, and the rest of the pigs, who had been lying in ambush in the cow shed, suddenly emerged in their rear, cutting them off. Snowball now gave the signal for the charge. He himself dashed straight for Jones. Jones saw him coming, raised his gun, and fired. The pellets scored bloody streaks along Snowball's back, and a sheep dropped dead. Without halting for an instant, Snowball flung his fifteen stone against Jones's leg. Jones was hurled into a pile of dung, and his gun flew out of his hands. But the most terrifying spectacle of all was Boxer, rearing up on his hind legs and striking out with his great iron shoed hoofs like a stallion. His very first blow took a stable lad from Foxwood on the skull and stretched him lifeless in the mud. At the sight, several men dropped their sticks and tried to run. Panic overtook them, and the next moment all the animals together were chasing them round and round the yard. They were gored, kicked, bitten, trampled on. There was not an animal on the farm that did not take vengeance on them after his own fashion. Even the cat suddenly leapt off of a roof onto a cowman's shoulders and sank her claws in his neck, at which he yelled horribly. At a moment... When the opening was clear, the men were glad enough to rush out of the yard and make a bolt for the main road. And so within five minutes of their invasion, they were in ignominious retreat by the same way as they had come, with a flock of geese hissing after them and pecking at their calves all the way. All the men were gone except one. Back in the yard, Boxer was pawing with his hoof at the stable lad who lay face down in the mud, trying to turn him over. The boy did not stir. He is dead, said Boxer sorrowfully. I had no intention of doing that. I forgot that I was wearing iron shoes. Who will believe that I did not do this on purpose? No sentimentality, comrade, cried Snowball, from whose wounds the blood was still dripping. War is war. The only good human being is a dead one. I have no wish to take life, not even human life, repeated Boxer, and his eyes were full of tears. Where is Molly? exclaimed somebody. Molly, in fact, was missing. For a moment there was a great alarm. It was feared that the men might have harmed her in some way, or even carried her off with them. In the end, however, she was found hiding in her stall, with her head buried among the hay in the manger. She had taken to flight as soon as the gun went off, and when the others came back from looking for her, it was to find that the stable lad who in fact was only stunned, had already recovered and made off. The animals had now reassembled in the wildest excitement, each recounting his own exploits in the battle at the top of his voice. An impromptu celebration of the victory was held immediately. The flag was run up and Beasts of England was sung a number of times. Then the sheep who had been killed was given a solemn funeral, a hawthorn bush being planted on her grave. At the graveside, Snowball made a little speech emphasizing the need for all animals to be ready to die for animal farm if need be. The animals decided unanimously to create a military decoration, Animal Hero First Class, which was conferred there and then on Snowball and Boxer. It consisted of a brass medal, they were really some old horse brasses which had been found in the harness room, to be worn on Sundays and holidays. There was also Animal Hero Second Class, which was conferred posthumously on the dead sheep. There was much discussion as to what the battle should be called. In the end, 
it was named the Battle of the Cowshed, since that was where the ambush had been sprung. Mr. Jones's gun had been found lying in the mud, and it was known that there was a supply of cartridges in the farmhouse. It was decided to set the gun up at the foot of the flagstaff, like a piece of artillery, and to fire it twice a year, once on October the 12th, the anniversary of the Battle of the Cowshed, and once on Midsummer Day, the anniversary of the Rebellion.